This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. The government of the United States wants you to tell it what race you belong to. And the government of the United States might think you're wrong. This is my interview with David Bernstein. I am joined from Arlington, Virginia by David Bernstein, professor at George Mason Law School, who has written a remarkable and I think essential book called Classified, which tells the story of racial categories that have been used and employed by the governments, the federal government and state governments in this country, um, especially since World War II. But David, I told you before we started rolling that I have been working on these, these issues, writing about them, studying them, teaching them race in America for decades. And I didn't know, sir, <laughs> basically anything that's in your book, which is absolutely, I think, the essential final chapter in the story of race in America. And everyone needs to read this book to understand how these ideas have been codified in law. But let me just start here. So I'm a historian. So I've, as I said, I've been talking about these issues for a long time. So everyone sort of agrees on this. Here's the basic story, right? That these horrible ideas about race and racism were invented in the late 18th and early 19th centuries and became this thing called scientific racism where people's skulls were getting measured and segregation was imposed and slavery was justified by these ideas that we all now consider to be horrific witchcraft. No one sees any value. I mean, these people think those are the most pernicious ideas ever invented in American history, maybe in world history. Well, it turns out, according to your book, that those ideas, those scientific racist ideas invented essentially by slave owners to justify slavery and segregation have been codified in law. That the government at various levels, federal, state, and even city levels, have used those very categories to classify all Americans and to give out particular benefits and privileges to certain people based on these categories of race that, again, date back to the slave owners. So tell us what happened up to World War II. We had segregation. We had scientific racism was, was basically the common way of thinking about things. But then after World War II, this changed, but it moved, these ideas about race moved into law. Is that right? So it's a tangled uh, story with no real protagonist in the sense that for the most part, <laughs> no, there was no central plan. There was no congressional legislation. No one thought this out. And really, um, after World War II, as, as you imply in what you just said, we started to move away from a history of racism in the U.S. There was, uh, as a result of several factors, including the rise of uh, crit you know, crit critiques of the scientific racism by uh, scientists, of, by sociologists, by anthropologists, uh, the Holocaust and the horror at what racism did in Europe. Uh, the rise in political power by African Americans themselves as they moved to the North, where they had um, you know more, much more say in what was going on than they had in the South. All these factors coalesced, and I think there was a time in the 1950s where the prediction would have been the civil rights movement will eventually triumph, and part of its triumph will be to wipe out all these racial categories and classifications. The problem is 
that part of the actual triumph of the civil rights movement was to try to make discrimination uh, illegal, first by government contractors, then by employers and universities and so forth, mortgage lenders uh, more generally. And the, que the question then became, well, how do you um, prohibit discrimination? How does the government monitor discrimination if we don't have statistics of how many people are being employed and how many people are being admitted to universities and how many people are getting mortgages? So you need some sort of classifications to uh, measure these things. And that, you know, I don't really emphasize this enough in the book, in my book Classified, because I didn't really, I don't think I really understood the importance of it until I looked back after I finished. It was already out, it was too late. But the question is, okay, in which groups are we going to protect from discrimination? And there was pretty bad discrimination historically against Jews and Catholics, and depending on the region, different, what we now would consider white ethnic groups. But the problem is that part of the nascent civil rights movement triumph is that you weren't at the time allowed to ask anyone about their racial or ethnic background. So when the government's figuring out, well, which groups are we going to classify? Well, if you can't ask people, then the only groups that you could really measure are the groups that are visible minorities. So people who are who look racially as, you know, if you want to use that term, uh, distinct. So while Jews and Catholics in the beginning were sort of considered some of the groups are going to protect, in the end, the government forms starting in the 1950s for government contracts and emerging into the civil rights era eventually settled on uh, Blacks, uh, Native Americans, American Indians, um, uh, different Asian groups. Originally, we mostly had Chinese, Japanese, and Filipinos. And, uh, well, Mexicans and Puerto Ricans had historically been considered really white groups. Enough of them were dark uh, in their complexions and had either indigenous or African origin that we could stick them in there as well with the help of lobbying from Mexican-American groups. So basically, we started having these classifications. And then as we had more and more civil rights laws and more and more laws trying to track educational, social, economic progress, health, and so forth from the government, we realized, wait a second, we are comparing apples and oranges because there's no consistent way of measuring these different groups. 